Hi everybody, so first and foremost, I would like to thank the organizers of this web conference on the African Commons. My presentation will focus on the changes in Ambosi's waterscape and land commons, Kenya, challenges for pastoral communities and natural resource management in a semi-arid environment. The Great Ambosi ecosystem is a social ecosystem located in a semi-arid zone in the south of Kenya. The region experiences bimodal rainfall varying between 350 and 500 mm per year. Precipitation is a key climatic component governing vegetation growth and production, and the abundance, biomass, and dynamics of animal populations. The ecosystem, mainly made up of savannas, is considered to be extremely dynamic. The landscapes of Amboseli are composed of very variable mosaic of patches of herbaceous, shrubby, and tree vegetation, as you can see on this map. You also have residences of rivers with varied flow, endoric swamps or lakes, seasonal rivers, artificial or natural reservoirs. This East African savanna is undergoing profound social, political, economic, and environmental changes in its social ecosystem function. This area is mainly inhabited by one of the 14 sections of the Maasai population, the Ilkosongo. This section is then divided into clans and subclans. The area they inhabit was after independence in 1964 divided into six root branches. As you can see on the map, you have Eselenke, Imbilikani, Kuku, Rombo, Kimana, and Olgulului or Arashi group branch. Today, Kimana and Loitaka are completely subdivided. Administratively, group branches are collective branches where resources are considered as common property. They include all those who have a membership card issued during the years of registration. They are considered as animal production system where a group of people jointly hold title to the land for the livestock and the achievement of joint management of land and resource. Still, Water is vested in and held by the national government in trust for the people of Kenya. In this presentation, we'll focus on the northern part of the ecosystem located in the old Gololui or group range. This particular system, called Nauru Enkare, Nauru for division and Enkare for water, by the population, and the northern pipeline by NGOs and local government organizations, groups together five interconnected and dependent villages in terms of access to water resources and some common pastures. This system was selected because it is a place of historic tension between pastoral practices and the needs of wildlife conservation by different actors. Land issues. As you can see on this second map, the Olgolului Olorashi group range is composed of different zoning schemes, but also different management systems. The group range is since September 2019 starting to be fully subdivided so that each member can obtain an equal share of the territory under the aegis of a key document, Olgolului Orashi Land Use and Subdivision Plan. To study and analyze the common land in political transformation and the dimensions of access to water in terms of infrastructure, management, perceptions and practices, we chose to use the concept of waterscape, which can be considered as partly natural and partly social, bringing together a multiplicity of processes and historic geographic relationships. In this context, we ask ourselves how the changes in the physical and social structure and dynamic of the waterscape could participate in a shift of the perceptions, practices and land tenure in relation with mismanagement and inequalities to the formation of successively social, cultural, political and economic crises. The results developed in this presentation were obtained within the Magnum project and the implementation of a mixed methodology was designed to answer three main research questions, as you can see on this slide. The first, the ethnographic fieldwork was set up with immersion in the field, interviews realized through a snowball slamping with different Maasai actors, government organizations, NGOs, research at the National Archives of Nairobi and direct and participant observations. The second tool of our mixed methodology is the participatory mapping workshop, which has been set up five times in each of the five interconnected villages of our study area. In our case, participatory mapping allowed us to access the description of the waterscape in its physical, social, spatial and temporal dimensions. To answer the question asked in, the, in this presentation and through the mixed methodology, we got these first results on the waterscape and the political management evolutions. The evolution of the waterscape in this area can be divided temporarily into four main periods. These were marked by different policies for the management of the commons, 
as well as modification of the practices of Maasai pastoralists. First, as you can see on this map, we have the pre-colonial period from the 17th to the beginning of the 20th century, during which the Maasai, I quote, lived on the shores of Lake Amboseli and the swamps which, is, which surround it. They used to be the central points of water in the livestock management strategy during the dry season before migrating to areas with better pastures according to the rains during the wet seasons. Then comes the colonial period from the beginning of the 20th century to 1964, marked by new policies for the management of land and wildlife, requiring the first development of Ilcholoys and Old Roto, meaning wells and shallow wells in Maasai, as you can see on the map. These infrastructure were made to keep cattle away from Lake Amboseli, the swamps, and the new Maasai Game Reserve established in 1948, so that it can accommodate wildlife and tourists as a priority. As you can also see, at the same period, there is the implementation of the Lovat Smith Canal, which results in the creation of a artificial reservoirs called the Lake Conch. The third period is the independence one, on the Embirica one, meaning water storage place in Maasai from 1964 to the 1990s. This period is marked by the annexation of the lake and the swamps for the gazettement of Amboseli National Park in 1974, becoming a state land for the preservation of wildlife, and the development of a water pumping system operating sporadically to supply five in the five interconnected villages of our study area. As you can see, the spring is, di is directly catch in the northern swamp and bring then water to Meshanani and Quito and Jakita, Risa and Remito area. This period was also marked by numerous interference from group ranch leaders who have privatized many lands. Finally comes the period of sedentarization of the Maasai around the water points built during the previous period, the Embirica, from 1990s to 2020. This period was also marked by an increase in the area of agriculture with partial subdivision by the group, the government and the group ranch leaders, and the individualization of access points to water, with the digging of hill reservoirs, called Silanke on, on the map, and boreholes, and finally the complete subdivision of the group ranch of Olgolului or Orashi. This period is also marked by the, the project of the rehabilitation of the pipeline, as you can see with the IFO pipeline in blue which is still nowadays not working. As you can see on these different maps, the waterscape has been evolving a lot through different periods. Still, interferences are there. The current interference can be illustrated by a recent example linked to the policy of rehabilitating the, the Nawurankare system or the Northern Pipeline. In 2008, during the implementation of an ecosystem management plan for Amboseli, the Kenyan Wildlife Service stated, there is a scarcity of water in the area. The water supply system is, however, unreliable due to frequent breakdown of the pumping system. And they have in the same document as a cent central action point to rehabilitate this water supply system. This project was to be carried out by IFO, in an international conservation NGO and KWS partner in the Olgololui Ororashi Group Ranch for the management of wildlife and their habitats. The information available on IFO website states in an article dated from November 6, 2019, as you can see in this quote, that the rehabilitation should be completed successfully at the end of 2019, bringing water to the Maasai community. However, at the beginning of 2020, and this until today, I quote from Maasai from the area, there is indeed a pipe which passes by our land. But the person who obtained the, co the construction contract ate all the money, and therefore, there was never any water that got here. This water would be perfect for us and our cattle. However, we have no contact with the, the people of IFO to obtain information on, that, on this. We know that they invested 80 million Kenya shillings and that they gave the contract to the national government. These interferences are accompanied by a definite lack of dialogue between the Maasai the government organization and NGO, and the absence of consultation in the establishment of infrastructure of policies for the management of resource 
and land. This also contributes to the formation of inequalities and a deepening of injustice experienced by the Maasai who remain misunderstood. In parallel with these impossibilities of access to water resources and an individualization of infrastructure, it is possible to observe an increase in frequency of droughts and intense climatic events. This contributes to a change from semi-nomadic pastoral practices towards a progressive and total sedentarization and an intensification of agriculture. I can quote, we have realized the need to diversify our activities to survive during droughts that we are experiencing more and more frequently. These phenomena are accompanied by impossibilities for certain Maasai to use their methodological knowledge and in particular the warning signs of rainy years or drought. I can quote also, today all the signs that we knew, like the stars, the flowerings, the lunar cycle, or from Venus, the observation of the cattle or the rites that we practice no longer allow us to know the decisions to be taken. For migrations or for planting, in this sense, the access to their own land and therefore private rights on this on it to practice agriculture to fight drought and influences or to drill a private borehole or artificial ponds seems to be a necessity. However, most of the Maasai interviewed have a convergent feeling. There is another direct cause leading to the crisis of the commons related to a political system increasingly based on clan membership and on the grabbing of certain lands by certain political leaders for their personal good. I quote, because of the strength of the clan in the political sphere, no decision is taken for common good, but only to meet the expectation of my clan. I quote again, all this corruption, this lack of consultation, clan assistance to obtain the best territories, will only allow the group pledge leaders to be the big winner in the subdivision. Thus, it would be by recovering 23 acres of land equally that the members could obtain, I quote, profit before the group pledge leaders had eaten everything or sold it the highest by that. Opinions are not always decisive and differ depending on the age, sex, financial, clan, and political situation of each of the individuals interviewed. The subdivision is carried out in a random manner. Each of the members registered on the group range list draw a piece of land from among thousands of others and has access to a predefined number according to the size of that clan. This can be many kilometers from an established water point or in a very arid area, or conversely, near a water point or a road. What is certain for all is that they will have to reduce the size of their livestock because they will obtain small land with different resources and very varied potential for access to water and pasture. The paradox is there. In order to fight injustice they experience, the Maasai risk to create new ones. Beyond this crisis of the commons, a socio-cultural and an identity crisis is underway. The waterscape allows us in this presentation to capture the distribution of water through time and across the study area. And it also allows us to understand how contested the water practice are. As you saw, the four points mentioned above have deeply participated in the formation of inequalities perceived by the Maasai in terms of access to land and to water as a common property resource. We must then ask ourselves, how would it be possible in the greater Amboseli ecosystem to bring together in the same arena different actors with different narratives and knowledge systems around water management, diversified land use, livelihood strategies, and land tenure transformations to create a dialogue? To answer this question, the role-playing game was thus been chosen as a catalyst for creating collaborative interactions and common learning between various actors with different visions and perceptions of and narratives about land and water. Three parts of the role playing game have now been put in place and seem to have significant potential in creating the necessary dialogue. The results of this part will be developed in another presentation by Christophe Lepage. Thanks for listening to this presentation.